Hey everyone, Mitchell here. Before we start the show, a huge thank you to the Walton Family Foundation. Thanks for the continued support this season. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fieldwork Podcast. I'm Mitchell Hora here with you, and I'm actually out on kind of a field trip here today. Todd, our producer, and I went out to Central Ohio, and we are hanging out at Dave Brandt's farm for Dave Brandt's field day. And Dave Brandt is one of the original no-till cover crop guys who's been doing it for forever. This episode here now, though, is really special because Ray Archuleta is one of the speakers at Dave's field day. We grabbed Ray after he gave his talk. Ray is, they call him the, Ray the soil guy. And Ray has spoke all over the world, teaching farmers about soil health. He taught me a lot about soil health and so many other farmers. Ray was with the NRCS, now Ray's a rancher down in Southwest Missouri. And now he's being able to really practice what he preaches. But I think you'll really enjoy our episode here as we dig into the why and the, the concepts behind this. Enjoy our chat here today as we're tuning in from Dave's Seed Shed. A lot of fun hanging out with Ray. I think you guys will really enjoy this episode too. Ray, we've you know we've known each other for a while now. You've been a key you know mentor and leader for me, and I thank you for that. And you've been showing all these farmers. You just got off stage. We're at Dave Brandt's Field Day as we're recording this here now. And your number one message to these farmers is cover the soil. Why is that number one? Let's start there. Why cover the soil? Well, thank you, Mitch. I think it's neat to see that young people like you are going to take the baton and pass it for the future because it's so important about regeneration, about healing the planet. Why is it so important to cover the ground? You know, I have learned through time that if, it, if the message is not simple and if you want a great change to happen, the message has to be very simple. The soil does not work without the plant. In fact, really the plant and soil are one. They're one unit. In fact, you can't even call it soil if you don't have plant because it's plant and microbes that makes it alive and call it soil. Without those two, you just have geology. I have said this many times. Soil without life is geology. That's the whole point. And then we're, telling to, we're trying to get the producer to understand if you could do one thing that's so critical and you never, never forget, never forget, cover the ground with living plants. That is a huge, huge importance. It ch it's a game changer for your farm. Well, and there's just so many people though, I think that are still in the excuses mode or they're looking at this cover as kind of a, a burden and, a, and an expense to put it out there. Um, a key thing that I've been thinking a lot about is that that cover crop is your offensive management tool. It's your nutrient stabilizer. It is pumping to feed those microbes, but it's your moisture management tool. It's your herbicide program, like the whole thing. How do you explain that? I oh, guess, man, you, you, were, you were going on a, on a, a roll, man. It, <laughs> nutrient sequesters. So many things. They're biological primers. Yeah. They're climate regulators. It, see, I, I guess that's why I hate the word cover crop. I, I wish there was another way we could call them because those plants do Raise so much. Raise magic plants. Yeah, raise magic <laughs> plants. It, because they, they do so much. They keep the soil surface cool. So th that plant and what they do will really help the producer because right now we're using too much chemicals or too much fertilizer, too much tillage. Filling that gap with living plants would help abate that. Tremendous. So yeah. how do we get that to be the priority though? Because I think that's the thing, don't you think? It's, yeah. you know, that, okay, here's that cover crop, but it's like, man, I got to go plant that cover crop. I'm trying to harvest. I'm trying to get all this work done in the fall. And then I got to plant this cover crop too. How do we change that mentality that, hey, that's my priority. I got to get this crop off because I got to get that cover crop on as fast as I can, you know, because that's the most important thing. Because when that crop's coming off, that plant's not alive anymore. It's not pumping those exudates. Yeah. I got to get that cover out there as quickly as I can. How do we, I think that's that just a tweak, you know, how do we, how do we get that? It, man, it's, I tell you, it's going to take, it's going to take a while. You think about, we have been ingrained for the last 60, 70 years, a certain way. And fertilizer has taken, has fertilizers and chemicals has made farming a lot easier, but almost very thoughtless. And so 
it's going to take a while to get people to transition. And I think that's why the message has to be so clear, so simple. Because do you know what? If you do not address the number one thing for humans is why should I listen to you? What benefit am I going to get? For sure. And that's that's where it comes to. Like I said, you're going to get all these benefits by covering the ground. And I think that's the key is it's an offensive management tool. They've been branded wrong. They've been branded yeah. as defense defense against erosion, defense against water quality issues. And that's fine. That's that's a, a angle for them. But it's hard to see that directly put dollars back in my pocket as a producer. So I think that offensive piece, that's just that slight tweak that I think that, but I think we're getting there. Well, let me ask you, Mitch, let's just remember before you met me. Yeah. You've been doing no-till for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember when you had your aha moment? Mm -hmm. Before then, how did you honestly really look at the soil? Not uh, not alive at all. I don't remember the one, but the thing, the story that comes to mind. Okay, so we started no-tilling in 1978, but we were not consistently no-tilling. And, um, but for the most part we were, but we didn't have the structure. We didn't have the system healthy at all. And I, at the time, was in the mindset of, in order for that corn to pop through in our reduced tillage system, you kind of had to have that tillage or else you'd get the crust right. on top. And I thought, well, yeah, sure, this no-till stuff, great, Ray. That's all fine and dandy. But if the corn doesn't come through, what good is this? Yeah. Well, now I know that the problem why we had the crust was because we were doing the tillage. And now we don't have that anymore. And now our structure is so good. Now we don't have crust in at all. Yeah. And now every single corn plant comes through. None of them corkscrew underneath the ground. Yeah. And it was because no-till on its own couldn't do it. Yeah. But if you get no-till with the covers, now you can eliminate that crust. And I think that's where a lot of people are falling short. Yeah. They're like, well, Ray, if I just do no-till, then it's going to be a rock out there. It's going to be cement. And, it was, and that's what exactly what happened. And you're right. Again, reductionism. We looked at one thing only. We didn't see the whole picture. Love no-till. Yeah. It stopped destruction of the house, but it wasn't feeding the house. It wasn't changing it. It's been amazing. You know, like we said, we've been using no-till for so long, but we haven't seen... It wasn't until we really got intense with the covers that now it's like, okay, wow, this is amazing. So let's back up here a little bit, though. Yeah. Let's start at the beginning with your story because yeah. you've been seeing this change and stuff for a long time. You started with NRCS. You're from New Mexico. Start at the very beginning and explain a little bit more maybe who you are yeah. and how we got to this point. Well, I grew up in a little town called Española. I grew up in northern New Mexico. Our family's been there for four or 500 years. We've been there for a long time. I knew at 15 years old that I was going to get into agriculture because I worked on my uncle's ranch. I just loved agriculture. I told my dad, Dad, I love being outside. I love lifting the bales. I love being out there with the cows. I just love being out there. And I said, this is my dream. 15 years old, I knew that. That was my butterfly effect moment. Then I started, I went to, a, got my associate's degree at, at Northern Community College. Then after I graduated, went and did a couple of years in the Peace Corps. I worked as a livestock specialist, came back, met my lovely wife, and I do things backwards, of course. Uh, we decided to go to college uh, when my twins were nine months old. So I went to college, worked full time, went to college full time, and raised twins when they were nine months old. Yes. It, <laughs> and Mitch, Mitch is going, I've you're got a my yeah, four month old at home. Yeah, it's you like, understand. That sounds a little busy, right? Think about that. If it wasn't for my amazing wife, I wouldn't be where I'm at. Yeah. So, it started then, then I went through the, another six years of college, I went to, all the way to graduate school. So I went down this journey, and I'll never forget, my first job uh, was, um, my well, my first professional job, because I got my degree, they put me in professional status. Before then, I was a technician designing irrigation systems. So I knew how to do a lot of engineering. But then, I, then when the moment I graduated from college, from agricultural biology and soils, I got hired in Missouri. In Missouri, I became an irrigation nutrient specialist. Worked there a year and a half, got familiar with rice and cotton and that, and then got promoted to a water quality specialist. And I ran, I ran the water quality office. But I had a hand green to go back out west. And then from there, I went to Oregon and worked in Oregon and, and lived in Idaho for five years. Then I became an agronomist there. Then I had another bar butterfly effect. I got a promotion to go to North Carolina, but it was in Idaho, I finally realized something's wrong. Something's very, very wrong. I think I was, Mitch, you're not even 40. It was in my 40s. Can you imagine depressed? Sitting there depressed and hating agriculture. 
I was hating agriculture. I was just so frustrated because I, every time the irrigation season would turn on, that water would turn into chocolate right at my border. And I see that farmers were not really gaining. They couldn't bring their sons and daughters into the operation. I said, how many acres do you really need? It, it was unattainable. I had 11 acres and, and, and the farmer with 500 acres couldn't bring his son into the operation. I just like, it was depressing. And then I got promoted. And then when I got promoted to North Carolina, this is when things started to happen. These little tiny butterfly effects that I, people were the right people, the right books changed my life. Exposed to the right people and the right books changed my life. And then that's where my journey for soil health, Mitch, think how embarrassing this is as a soils, a soils graduate, didn't even know the soil was alive and that really didn't understand that the microbes. So what were some of those initial connections? It was the people even when you were in Idaho that it was the moment you met somebody out there or was it that was in Idaho or that's when you got to In North Idaho, Carolina? I started questioning. Mitch. You were questioning in Idaho, and I, but you and didn't I, find the answers yet. Yeah, I couldn't find the answers. Yeah. And, and, and that's the problem. I couldn't find the answers. But it was going to Gabe's Ranch in 2007 Seven. and reading Ellen Savory's book on holistic management putting those pieces together and I'm going, ah, I just, I got it. I said, oh my goodness, we missed it. Yeah. And I started being a, a crazy person wanting to teach that. And then we started putting those flake demos together and my little infiltrations, remember? But at this point, I mean, you were, fair, you were in North Carolina and you were fairly high up within MCS. Yes, yes. I mean, you had a really good spot. You had definitely worked uh, the, your way up the system. Yeah. Like you were, I mean, you were in a good a really good spot. Yeah. I forget what your title was. When oh, you were I was conservation agronomist and of the soil quality team. Right. And so what I landed up doing is I bypassed the state office. So I went from a uh, area office position to a technical responsibility for national responsibility for teaching soil quality. Right, on the national side. That's what on I mean. An, yeah, so I you became went from national. the state side to the national side. And then you found the answer after that. Yes. And it was in 2000. See, I was already at the tech center. It's called the National East National Technology Service Center. My responsibility was I had national responsibility, which allowed me the conduit to be able to teach this all lower. The, I became a very effective, good virus. So in, then in 2007, you were able to kind of have that aha moment, yeah. seeing Gabe, seeing, reading the books. Like, oh, wow, here's the answer that you were yes. finally looking for yes. for a couple decades, it sounds yes. like, trying to find the answer. Yeah. Then you had it, and you stayed within NRCS for a little while then, a couple I, more years, I and teaching, though, yeah. Yeah. And, and doing your speeches and stuff. I retired in 2016. I put 30 years in. I spent the last 15 years of my career teaching soil health, which was kind of fortunate I didn't get fired. But I got, there was times that I, I always pushed the envelope because- but if it wasn't for the the farmers wanting me, uh, I, I, it, I it would have been rough for me. Yeah. I was very in demand at that time. But you finally found the, your aha and your solution. And obviously your key thing that I is overwhelming the evident is your passion. Yeah. That's what farmers believe in. And that's why you're such a dynamic speaker and stuff that your passion is unlike anybody else's for this, but because you found that solution and now you're passionate about it and then we can get other people passionate about it. How does that, I mean, that's the butterfly effect. That's, yes. that's the real butterfly effect. Mitch, it's because I love people and I care about the land. Mm -hmm. About I, That's what we do. We care. That's why you're in here. Yeah. That's why you are here. Totally. It's, and then until you feel that passion for people and for the land that you want to be part of the healing process. That's why I call it healing and forgiveness agriculture. Regenerative agriculture is a healing forgiveness agriculture. The forgiveness of the land, forgiveness of all our past sins with the land. It's beautiful. It's, a, it's hope now. You remember the Kiss the Ground, the movie? Uh, I was already, Kiss the Ground documentary came out in 2020. I was already, that movie, that documentary took seven years to produce. And I asked just several things from Josh Tikal when he made that. I said, Josh, give people hope and give animals the glory they deserve in healing the planet. And he did that. Yeah. Millions of people have watched that documentary. I get calls from, I still get phone calls from all over Mitch on because of that documentary. Oh. And so that documentary had a huge impact in me for my, for me personally. Yeah, I've been talking with, you know, some folks pretty high up and some big companies and I talk about regenerative ag and they're like, oh, like that Kiss the Ground on, on Netflix? I'm like, yeah, just like that. Just like that. They're yeah. like, do you know those guys? I'm like, yeah, because I forget one of them. I was like, yeah, because we we have Gabe Brown on this season as well. We have Dave Brand on this season. So many of these key 
mm-hmm. folks, you know, that's like, okay, that message, you know, that it's part of the community here, that that community though is there's been a core kind of nucleus and now that community is really growing and, and expanding well beyond. So to your point on the, the documentary, on so much more information out there, it's going beyond farmers, but let's just stick with an ag. How do you see this tidal wave really building? What's your observation there? And, you know, what have you seen even, it seems like it's accelerating. Oh, What's your take? Look, they just did a survey in the last 10 years, there's been a 77% increase in cover crops on the land. And so we're seeing it. You're seeing the change. They told us, Mitch, when this first came out, it was a fad that was going to disappear. It's people like you, young people, that have taken it. This is not a fad. No. They want change. Young people want change. They want hope. The biggest thing is that it it helps everybody to actually be more profitable. Yes. And that's the key. Yep. That I always say, you know, sustainability doesn't matter if the farm is not economically sustainable. Yep. How do we get farmers over that? little hump. Well, you know what? Sometimes uh, uh, we're not doing critical thought process. Let me give you an example. I said, does it, is it easier to work with nature or to work against it? It's that simple. All we're saying is if you emulate it and work with it, she pays the tab. She pays for the energy. She does. She'll help you. She was designed to help you. Yeah. That's all we're saying. It's pretty simple. We're not asking we're not, we're not giving complicated message. So, and I've, we talked about it last night and I've talked with you about it before that that aha moment often comes when you do the shovel tool, the shovel test that you do that, that I learned from you where it's take a shovel full of soil from in your field versus a shovel full from the side of the field that's, that's native, yeah. hasn't been disturbed, or at least Isn't hasn't been disturbed for a tool? long time. Yeah. Explain that. Where did you learn that? Or what was your aha moment that that was the ultimate tool that costs $0? Yeah. And that is the ultimate. Oh, the show. The, I call, they, there's a saying, Mitch, the eye is the opening to the soul. The shovel is the same. The moment you pull that shovel, you, you pierce into that soul of that, of that soil. Where I learned that was, look, digging around, you start saying, let's see how the forest, let's, let's go right to the edge. Let's see how nature does business. Let's see how I do business. And then you start digging and going, oh, my goodness, the colors are different. The smell is different. You go, oh, this is where I want to go. She's my template. So when you got a producer that's got these kind of filters and that, that's why, Mitch, I was able to impact you. I know I only have a couple of minutes whether you can listen to me or not. Yeah. So when I pulled that shovel, showed you your soil, and then we walked to the edge of the grass strip, and you go, whoa. But you had somebody able to explain it. Totally. If it wasn't for all the books and the papers and everything I read and started creating context, a lot of it, our knowledge, Mitch, is progressive revelation. What does that mean? We learn through progression. We're not instantaneous and get the knowledge right away. We learn from people we come in contact. We learn skill things. I, You know what we're good? We're good mimickers. We mimic each other. Totally. We all learn from each other. I learn from you. All of us learn. So that's how I learned to use that tool because I know... I have a short time with you. Yeah. But that's the number one thing that you can show people at an event from somebody's field, and then they can easily go home and do it. Yeah. Test and they can see it on their own. But it definitely is crucial when you can have somebody else there to look at it and explain it and stuff with you. I think that's really big. We'll be right back after this short break. Have you ever done that test when it's like a big food company or what yes. some of those folks, what yes. did they say? And what's been there? Like what's one of those big aha moments? Same, like that? same, same, same response. It's those little demos I do, the shovel, and also a little infiltration ring where we pour water. Uh, one of some of the most difficult people to teach is people that have college degrees in their field. Uh, people that are, that's their field. They're difficult to teach. People, food processor people, people that have no or people that have degrees in journalism, they're easy. Why? They don't have all these filters. So that when you guide them, and te- you know what the first thing a lot of times when you teach people that don't have that background, you know what the first thing they tell me, Mitch, when they, once they get it? That makes sense. They get it quicker than the farmers. Oh, yeah. They don't have all these filters. They don't have the preconceived issues and stuff for like that, that, con- that preconceived notion of what it's supposed to look like or how it's supposed to be done. Do you know where you picked it up from? You picked up your preconceived from your dad. Oh, yeah. You picked it up from the neighborhood. Yeah. You picked it up from the rural community. 
Yeah. But that's why I think where I'm at, there are so many people that we are having good success with this now. And it's picked up because at the beginning it was no till or basically no till or very close to it. And it was, okay, well, we do that because we don't have to spend as much money on tillage and we don't have to have these massive tractors and we don't need to spend all the time yeah. and it saves on erosion. And now it's the cover crop. And now, yeah, we are learning from those other folks around mm -hmm. to say, okay, that that notion is changing, but it's because there's been people in that area doing covers for more than 40 years. Yeah. So it's a it's a journey of the the along the adoption curve. Right now, there's just little pockets yeah. of that. How what have you observed from those pockets versus the lack of people adopting in between the pockets of good adoption? Good, good question, Mitch. Here's the reality. We're at we're still at early innovators. Yeah. We're not at early adopters. Until we get about 13 to 14, 15 percent of the whole population of the farmers, you're not going to go to early adopters. But once we reach that threshold, a majority will go. And the last 20 percent, I call them the incorrigible. You'll never reach them. So you don't care about that. Once we reach 13 to 15 percent, then it will go forward. Look at no-till has been around since the 70s. Still not widely adopted. It's still not adopted. Why? We haven't reached the threshold. And the, and some of the farmers, to be honest with you, they saw that it wasn't it didn't work for their no-till farmers. They had the crusts. Yeah. They had stratification, chemical stratification. It was an imperfect system, but they still had better infiltration than some of their tillage brothers and sisters. But it it wasn't it wasn't a complete system. So there's a lot of folks that want us to get to that threshold. Yeah. A lot of these companies and massive money. Yeah. And there's a lot of money sitting there. Yeah. And you're talking to a lot of guys with a lot of money. I'm And there's a lot of these you guys too. Yeah. that are looking at how do we do this? The money's not really moving yet. The farmers are like, oh, hey, I kind of need some some help to do this. What's it going to take to enable that to actually go, you think? Because it seems like we're so close. Yeah. And like, and to get to that tidal wave, because then all you got to do is get that next chunk of farmers in, and then you get to the next waves of the adoption curve that move extremely quickly. Yeah. So it seems like it's going to go really fast when it, it is. happens, but what's it going to take to... Well, here's my big concern is that if, look, even among ourselves in the regenerative movement, we're fragmented. Yeah. It would be great if we had a collective message that we would walk, work more together if we did. My concern is if, if there's one regenerative group promoting this certification and one the other, and it's not a collective unified message. Look, just to get the organic label took years, Mitch. It took years. And it's failed us. It's failed us here. And do I have a problem with organic? No, I buy organic product all the time. And it's, I think that we as a collective, and I mean every group, if we, it would be great if we had more of a collective message that we can make sure that, that we give people a clear, simple message. And that's one thing. It has to be simple, Mitch. And, you, I, and I think you appreciate simplicity. A hundred percent do. And uh, my definition of regenerative ag is that it's a continual implementation of the principles of soil health. Yeah. It's just, hey, here's the principles. They're there. You know, minimal disturbance, armor, living roots, diversity, yeah. Yeah. livestock, context. Yeah. Very simple. Yeah. So what's your definition of regenerative ag? And, you know, and because I don't know that we're, there's going to be like a one set certification. Yeah. I don't, and I don't think that's the right thing even. Right. You know, Mitch, I, I love, I think, because you're it's very similar. Regenerative agriculture to me is first is a change of heart and mind first. Mm. It's a it's a relationship that you that you mimic nature's design and goals. And those principles is that mimic of those 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 design. And and so I have a slide that says regenerative agriculture is a journey of the change of the heart and mind. It has to change here first. Totally. If you don't have the heart and the commitment, the heart is the commitment, it's the drive. Yeah. But they, they work together with the intellectual part. I I get it then it's a journey for your life. It's for, and to mimic nature, it's very simple. So I try to keep it, a, the message is simple. It's a journey, how to mimic nature. But a lot of the money and stuff and a lot of the programs out there are, here, do this one practice, or hey, add this one new thing. It's not necessarily about the education and about, you know, be like, look at this in a different way. It, does, it seems like there's a disconnect. Here's what I was thinking, Mitch, look, like I know you're working on a certification process, and I think that, and which is good. But here's what I was thinking, because um, Finian, you know Finian from Kiss the Ground, called me, and he says, Ray, 
because they're, they're trying to get stuff to Congress and how they're going to do it. And we have to be careful how we ask because our planet needs covering now. Mm-hmm. We're uh, we're at a pinnacle, and I'm not a doomsdayer. I'm not, but I've never seen so much hope here now. But what I'm saying is, what if producers got paid sixty to seventy dollars just to cover it? Then if they want to take it to a higher level, like $100, $120 an acre, whatever it is to be more regenerative than we cut the fertilizers and the chemicals, then I first like, let's cover it now. And then people like yourself and say, okay, let's take you to a higher level. We can cut the chemicals. We can do all these other stuff, make you more regenerative. Then we can talk about raising the the, the the financial benefits for the producer. If we can get the government and, and people, what your, your company's doing and get all these people together as a collective, this is cool because the government is not going to be able to carry out this on their own. No. They can't. There's too many. Here's the brutal reality. We don't even have enough cover crop seed. Yeah. Let's say we want to make a goal. That's goal. I was going to say. It'd be great to have yeah. everyone, hey, just plant covers, but the seed doesn't exist. No. And we're in Dave Brandt's you know, seed warehouse. There's a lot of seed here, but not enough. No. So you know what now? Creating a different market. People say, well, Ray, don't you want everybody? I said, yeah, we're not ready for them. I'd be just happy if we get 1% or 2% per year to start changing because we don't have enough teachers. We don't have enough cover crop seed. Totally. We don't have enough of everything. But we have a goal. If we can start, I tell you, Mitch, if we can cover 50 million acres in the next five years, it'd be huge. Oh, yeah. That's where I'm going at. I think you're totally right that, you know, my take is, hey, there's money, there's money out there for yeah. cost share and programs and stuff. And, and states like mine have, it's very, very simple to get the money to. It's yeah. not massive dollars, but it's really simple. But yeah, you got to make sure that the seed is there, but you got to make sure that you're educated. Because in our first year using covers, we screwed it up. Yeah. And we lost $100 an acre. Yeah. And, see, that's and a lot that's, of other people have had those kind of issues too, but it's because we didn't understand carbon to nitrogen ratio. We didn't understand that soil biological function and we had to build up our Yeah, your soil's degraded. We didn't know. Yeah, didn't we, understand understand the context. we didn't understand the context of the system and the step-by-step on how to get there. And we got to be able to teach and we got to have more teachers because there's definitely a lack of that. Yes. Especially like, because there's only what, 4% of farmers that are using covers today. Yeah. And very few of them know how to teach it. And I would argue very few of them should even attempt to teach it. And and some don't even, uh, they're not implementing and they shouldn't be teachers. But we have a very tiny, tiny percentage. That's why I say, Mitch, you're, you're that next generation of teachers. But it's showing, I think so much of it for me, okay, one of, one of the things that I think can really be done with to get more people to go is to help them to understand where they're at today. Here's where you're at today. And here is your opportunity to improve because most of them believe that they're doing just fine yeah. right now. Most farmers don't understand how degraded it is. They no. see, oh, I'm raising 260 bushel corn year over year. Sure, it takes you know 260 units of nitrogen to do it, but that's what I was told. It's a pound of nitrogen per bushel right. anyway, right. so I must be doing fine. Yeah. So th- I think how do we enable people to understand where you're at today so that they can open their eyes to like, oh, wow, I'm – I'm not maybe doing as well as what I thought I was. You know how ambassadors, examples in the local area, they watch you. Why are you doing it so differently? They start questioning, look at your area, how it's expand, Mitch. Look, if we think that a group of, if I have 100, 200 beginning farmers or people that have never seen this, and I, that's why when I have to talk to a group that's never, never seen, especially farmers, that's why I have to do the soil demonstrations. I have to do, I have to spend a day with them in the field like I spend with you, Mitch. Yeah. I can't reach you. The basics. The it's basics. Gotta be the, the basics, the rainfall simulator, the slake test, all these kind the of shovels, things. The shovels, the infiltration ring. Totally. I have to go through that whole deprogramming process for you to get it. So that the thing is going to take a while. It's going to take a while. Mm-hmm. But be sober where we're at. And we don't feel like we have to convert everybody. I, I'm, I've chilled out about that. I used to try to feel like I got to get everybody to convert. No. Don't, that's not my job. My job is to drop seed and then the Mitch, Mitch's and them and the local community are going to change it. That's how it's going to change. Totally. It's going to be slower than we think, but that's just the way it is. Yeah, but now you're getting enough of kind of that that concept of one person teaches six others or two others or one other person. That person teaches a couple more and that one a couple more. And, it's like a, and it goes from there. It's by it's an upside down pyramid. The flying V. 
Yeah, it's like a V and it starts getting bigger, bigger until finally the whole mask goes. Yeah. Let's talk about um, just because we're here and what's your Dave Brandt story and, and what, why, how are some of these guys like how have they impacted you, whether it be Dave or some of these other key people? Oh, they had a huge impact on me. Yeah. I remember when I first made Dave Brandt in 2010. He was one of the very few people that were using cover crops. And there was this automatic synergy because he had one piece of the puzzle that he was applying consistently. And he could he was already doing no-till. He's been doing covers for a long time. And he's been the lone ranger talking about because it was very lonely for him back in the 70s, you think about it. He was very one of the very few that started using covers consistently. And it was just a very difficult message. But... I was already getting to a point that I, I, I was already already three years already getting it. And so then when we got together, it was just synergy. It was this collaborative process that just, and so farmers along the path, I tell people, farmers have taught me along the path. They say, well, Ray, you've taught, no, it's a two-way street. We've been totally. teaching each other. Yeah. And so um, it had a huge impact on me. And, then, and they've taught me, Gabe Brown taught me a lot. and. Uh, Jay Fuhrer, I can name so many people that I have taught me so much. That's been the biggest thing, especially for me being 27 and on all this. No. The only reason that I'm where I'm at is from learning from all these other people. I didn't Absolutely. learn it. You don't learn it at Iowa State. You don't no. learn it. Oh, just from reading isn't going to teach you all of it. You got to learn it from those people. But it, I think there's so many farmers. We were talking about it yesterday that now farmers on these next waves just want it to be that easy button. Here's the script. And just follow the script and it's going to be there. But I think Lauren was talking about that, that it's if you just do exactly what I'm doing or exactly what you tell them to do step by step, it's not going to work. Yep, It's got to fit within and they've got to maybe learn and fail a little bit, which I think a lot of farmers are going to really struggle with that piece that you've got to actually maybe hit a couple of hurdles. Um, and, and I didn't really realize that before. I thought it was going to be that the newcomers could learn enough from our stumbles that maybe they could avoid those stumbles, but those stumbles are really important. Mitch, when I'm listening to you, I think about this thought process. Freedom isn't free. Financial freedom isn't free. There has to be a price paid. You have to manage. You have to put the time in. You have to read. You have to observe. You have to be good around. I mean, you have to learn from others. You have, you know, regenerative agriculture is a journey of humility. That's how knowledge comes in. If you think you know too much, you're lost. I, I can't help you. It's a journey, and it's a, it's a humbling journey because you're always learning, you're always growing, it's always dynamic, it's always changing on you. And so you'll be spending the rest of your life, but we will both spend the rest of our life learning totally. and, and know very little. That's where I was going to get to. What do you want to learn next, or where do you where do you want to continue to to go? You have a lot of different things going on, and you have your own ranch, and we yeah. didn't even talk about all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Now, but but where where do you, what else do you need to learn? You know what? I, I, I want to learn. I'm always trying to build a way how to be a better communicator, how to be a better teacher, how to reach people, how to be to be very observant and, and still learn more about uh, the science, continually learn more about that. Uh, that's why I bought my own ranch. I wanted the practical logistics. It's not enough to talk about it. You've got to be doing it. And so... Uh, that little ranch that I bought from my wife and myself has been such a training ground. Now I'm going to, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working on getting a planter, a little corn planter. I'm going to grow sweet corn and I'm going to roll my own covers. And, um, I don't know if you ever saw Mitch, my, I, uh, have my, uh, I rolled my cover crops with my daughter's Volkswagen. Yeah, yeah, I've seen your video. Yeah. It's hilarious. And, and, and people love that because they, they say, wow. Um, so uh, that's my journey that I, I'm going to continue to teach, Mitch. I'm, I'm not going to lose focus on what I'm here for. My job is to communicate and to teach and give people hope. I'm a, most of my time I spend cheerleading, to be honest with you. And then um, continue to learn the logistical parts of how the world that you're in. Because really a lot of people that come and ask me are people in your world in corn and soybean. Totally. It's rarely ranchers. It's corn and soybean. And so if I can help them down this journey of the simple messages, we're going down a long path. Just so many people, yeah, in, in the row crop side, they're like, wow, fertilizer prices are through the roof right now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, commodity prices are good, but land price is going up like crazy. Equipment price, all these other inputs are going up like crazy. And they're yeah. like, wow, like what, what's, 
there's a lack of hope there. And I think that's why the suicide rate in ag and stuff is so high. Yes. Things like that. Yeah. And mental health issues and things like that, the lack of hope. And I think that's what they're now searching for is there's got to be a better way. And there's got to be that beacon of hope. And that's what is the real promise, I think, for the future. Isn't that, is that. Exci- Isn't that exciting? It's awesome. Yeah. Ah, uh, that's what I get up in the morning. I have hope now. Yeah. We can fix this. What else? Any Anything we didn't cover? Last thoughts or things to... To share, because there's there's a lot of folks that are going to listen to this. What's I think, Mitch, one of the things I, you and I, and I've and I've seen you've been pushing this a lot, and I do too. Build community. Yeah. D- don't do this by yourself. You will spend the rest of your life trying to figure it out. Find a nucleus of guys that you share your own demonstrative research. Do your own research. Do not wait on university to work. Wait on NRCS. You'll wait forever. They just don't have the people and the staff. Do your own. Bring people that think regenerative, think agroecology. They want to mimic nature. The goal is that. And work together as a community. Because look, Mitch, you're 29 years old. Say let's 30. 27 even, right? You're 27. You're made, you're so young. That's awesome. <laughs> let's say just for simple math, 30. Yep. But you're not. Yep. You may have 40, 50 growing seasons in you. That's you. Not it, enough. It, uh, not enough. Yeah. When you have five or 10 guys working with you with the same goal, now you increase exponentially 10 times your knowledge because you do this, you do that, do that, and you work as a collaborative. That's what we need to push. And you've been pushing, pushing that like I have. Yeah. That's, you got to do that. And that's what's been so crucial in my area is that was set up before I got there. Good. You know, I was a kid. And it, that was already kind of a thing. So I think that is crucial, though. And that's why Washington County has worked, because they had that core and they were sharing ideas and they were learning from each other. It, it, so I see it can work and it already is working. And I see because now we're getting to those later adopters that have that are saying, hey, you guys are all making this work and it looks good and you haven't gone broke yet so you must be making money and those farmers are the ones that are you know we're expanding and and have the opportunity and now those other later adopters are saying well okay there must be something to this remember last night we talked about it we said leaders we need leaders say this is the goal nature's the goal and this is what we're going to do and we're not going to stop we're building leaders for the future and that's and that's what you're doing that's what we're doing so I think that's the future. I think mentoring people and getting them ready for the next gear up because it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue to grow. I really believe that. Ray, it's been too long. It's like season four, and I'm like, okay, we got to get Ray. Yeah, that was great, Ray. Well, everyone, that's for field work today. Thanks for hanging out with us. Our show is produced by Todd Melby with lots of great help from Anna Canny. Kristen Schmidt runs our social media, and Lauren Humper is our project coordinator. Thanks to all the technical directors at American Public Media who help us record and mix our show. Be sure to check us out on social media. We're at Fieldwork Talk on all the usual channels, and we'd love it if you wrote us a review to help other people find us. Don't forget that we love hearing from you, so give us a call, leave us your comments, your questions at 651-228-4810, 651-228-4810. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time.